Uh, good morning. Uh, it's me, Brad, uh, doing one of my least favorite things, which is using video as a means of communication, which I hate to do outside of work Zoom meetings, which I have to do a lot these days, and so does everybody else. Um, I thought this morning I would uh, record a story uh, specifically for my nieces, Adriana and Tess, uh, but also um, for anyone else who is out there and would like to listen to a story during these somewhat, uh, I guess you'd say stressful and worrisome days. I know they're stressful and worrisome for me. Uh, we are here in my hobbit hole. That's my bedroom that way right there. Uh, and my roommates may come and go. You may see life happening. Uh, furthermore, this is kind of extemporaneous, so I have not rehearsed this in the, in the slightest. And uh, so please expect an imperfect reading of what is probably the most perfect or one of the most perfect stories uh, in modern English. Uh, and that is Delmore Schwartz in Dreams Begin Responsibilities. Uh, this is a really remarkable story from the 1930s, uh, and it kind of was the birth of modern American fiction. Uh, and Delmore Schwartz, in particular, was a really interesting guy. Um, and, you know, one of his students was the famous lyricist and musician uh, Lou Reed, who went on to have tremendous influence, uh, which is still very much felt today. Uh, yeah, so it all goes back to Delmore Schwartz, who wrote this in the 30s. Well, he wrote this when he was 21, which is remarkable. Uh, the story goes that he wrote this basically in one sitting over a single weekend, which if, if you've ever tried to write a story, you know how extraordinarily difficult that is. And to have it come out basically perfect on your first draft is just otherworldly. Um, so anyway, this is, of course, a story that I respect a great deal, and I hope you like it. So, without any further ado, let's read Delmore Schwartz's In Dreams Begin Responsibilities. 1. I think it is the year 1909. I feel as if I were in a motion picture theater, the long arm of light crossing the darkness and spinning, my eyes fixed on the screen. This is a silent picture, as if an old biograph one, in which the actors are dressed in ridiculously old-fashioned clothes, and one flash succeeds another with sudden jumps. The actors, too, seem to jump about and walk too fast. The shots themselves are full of dots and rays, as if it were raining when the picture was photographed. The light is bad. It is Sunday afternoon, June 12, 1909 and my father is walking down the quiet streets of Brooklyn on his way to visit my mother. His clothes are newly pressed and his tie is too tight in his high collar. He jingles the coins in his pockets, thinking of the witty things he will say. I feel as if I had by now relaxed entirely in the soft darkness of the theater. The organist peels out the obvious and approximate emotions on which the audience rocks unknowingly. I am anonymous, and I have forgotten myself. It is always so when one goes to the movies. It is, as they say, a drug. My father walks from the street to street of trees, lawns, and houses, once in a while coming to an avenue on which a streetcar skates and gnaws, slowly progressing. The conductor, who has a handlebar mustache, helps a young lady wearing a hat like a bowl with feathers onto the car. She lifts her long skirt slightly as she mounts the steps. He leisurely makes change and rings his bell. It is obviously Sunday, for everyone is wearing Sunday clothes, and the streetcar's noises emphasize the quiet of the holiday. It is not Brooklyn. Is not Brooklyn the city of churches? The shops are closed and their shades drawn, but for an occasional stationery store or drugstore with great green balls in the window. My father has chosen to take this long walk because he likes to walk and think. He thinks about himself in the future, and so arrives at the place he is to visit in a state of mild exaltation. He pays no attention to the houses he is passing in which the Sunday dinner is being eaten, nor to the many trees which patrol each street, now coming to their full leafage, 
and the time they will roam or broom the whole street in cool shadow. An occasional carriage passes, the horse hooves falling like stones in the quiet afternoon, and once in a while an automobile looking like an enormous upholstered sofa puffs and passes. My father thinks to my mother of how nice it will be to introduce her to his family, and he's not yet sure that he wants to marry her, and once in a while he becomes panicky about the bond already established. He reassures himself by thinking of the big men he admires who are married. William Randolph Hearst and William Howard Taft, who has just become president of the United States. My father arrives at my mother's house. He has come too early and is so suddenly embarrassed. My aunt, my mother's sister, answers the loud bell with her napkin in her hand, for the family is still at dinner. As my father enters, my grandfather rises from the table and shakes hands with him. My mother has run upstairs to tidy herself. My grandmother asks my father if he has had dinner and tells him that Rose will be downstairs soon. My grandfather opens the conversation by remarking on the mild June weather. My father sits uncomfortably near the table, holding his hat in his hand. My grandmother tells my aunt to take my father's hat. My uncle, 12 years old, runs into the house, his hair tousled. He shouts a greeting to my father, who has often given him a nickel, and then runs upstairs. It is evident that the respect in which my father is held in this is held in this household is tempered by a good deal of mirth. He is impressive, yet he is very awkward. Two. Finally, my mother comes downstairs, all dressed up, and my father, being engaged in conversation with my grandfather, becomes uneasy, not knowing whether to greet my mother or to continue the conversation. He gets up from the chair clumsily and says hello gruffly. My grandfather watches, examining their congruence, such as it is, with a critical eye, meanwhile rubbing his bearded cheek roughly, as he always does when he reflects. He is worried. He is afraid that my father will not make a good husband for his oldest daughter. At this point, something happens in the film, just as my father is saying something funny to my mother and I am awakened to myself and my unhappiness, just as my interest is rising. The audience begins to clap impatiently. Then the trouble is cared for, but the film has returned to a portion just shown, and once more I see my grandfather rubbing his bearded cheek and pondering my father's character. It's difficult to get back into the picture once more and forget myself, but just as my mother giggles at my father's words, the darkness drowns me. My mother, uh, my father and mother depart from the house, my father shaking hands with my mother once more out of some unknown uneasiness. I stir uneasily too, also, slouched in the hard chair of the theater. Where is the older uncle, my, older, my mother's older brother? He's studying in his bedroom upstairs, studying for his final examination at the College of the City of New York, having a dead rapid pneumonia for the last 21 years. My mother and father walk down the same quiet streets once more. My mother is holding my father's arm and telling him of the novel, which she has been reading, and my father utters judgments of the characters as the plot is made clear to him. This is a habit which he very much enjoys, and he feels the utmost superiority and confidence when he approves and condemns the behavior of other people. At times he feels moved to utter a brief ugh whenever this story becomes what we would, he would call sugary. This tribute is paid to his manliness. My mother feels satisfied by the interest with which she has awakened. She is showing my father how intelligent she is, and how interesting. They reach the avenue, and the streetcar leisurely arrives. They are going to Coney Island this afternoon, although my mother considers that such pleasures are inferior. She has made up her mind to indulge only in a walk on the boardwalk and a pleasant dinner avoiding the riotous amusements as being beneath the dignity of, such, of so dignified a couple. My father tells my mother how much money he has made in the past week, exaggerating an amount which need not have been exaggerated, but my father has always felt that actuality somehow falls short. Suddenly I begin to weep. The determined old lady who sits next to me in the theater is annoyed and looks at me with an angry face, and being intimidated, I stop. I drag out my handkerchief and dry my face, licking the drops which have fallen near my lips. 
Meanwhile, I have missed something, for here my mother and father are lighting at the last stop, Coney Island. 3. They walk towards the boardwalk, and my father commands my mother to inhale the pungent air from the sea. They both breathe in deeply, both of them laughing as they do so. They have in common a great interest in health. Although my father is strong and husky, my mother frail. Their minds are full of theories of what is good to eat and not good to eat, and sometimes they engage in heated discussions of the subject, the whole matter ending in my father's announcement, made with a scornful bluster that you have to die sooner or later anyway. On the boardwalk's flagpole, the American flag is pulsing in an intermittent wind from the sea. My, mother, my father and mother go to the rail of the boardwalk and look down on the beach, where a good many bathers are casually walking about. A few are in the surf. A peanut whistle pierces the air with its pleasant and active whine, and my father goes to buy peanuts. My mother remains at the rail and stares at the ocean. The ocean seems merry to her. It pointedly sparkles, and again and again the pony waves are released. She notices the, girl, the children digging in the wet sand and the bathing costumes of the girls who are her own age. My father returns with the peanuts. Overhead, the sun's lighting, uh, lightning strikes and strikes, but neither of them are at all aware of it. The boardwalk is full of people dressed in their Sunday clothes and idly strolling. The tide does not reach as far as the boardwalk, and the strollers would feel no danger if it did. My mother and father lean on the rail of the boardwalk and absently stare at the ocean. The ocean is becoming rough. The waves come in slowly, tugging strength from far back. The moment before they somersault, the moment when they arch their backs so beautifully, showing green and white veins amid the black, that moment is intolerable. They finally crack, dashing fiercely upon the sand, actually driving full force downward against the sand, bouncing upward and forward, and at last petering out into a small stream which races up the beach and is then recalled. My parents gaze absent-mindedly at the ocean, scarcely interested in its harshness. The sun overhead does not disturb them. But I stare at the terrible sun which breaks up sight and the fatal, merciless, passionate ocean, and I forget my parents. I stare fascinated, and finally shocked by the indifference of my father and mother, I burst out weeping once more. The old lady next to me pats me on the shoulder and says, There, there, all this is only a movie, young man only a movie. But I look up once more at the terrifying sun and the terrifying ocean, and being unable to control my tears, I get up and go to the men's room, stumbling over the feet of the other people seated in my row. 4. When I return, feeling as if I had awakened in the morning, sick for lack of sleep, several hours have apparently passed, and my parents are riding on the merry-go-round. My father's on a black horse, my mother on a white one, and they seem to be making an eternal circuit for the single purpose of snatching the nickel rings, which are attached to the arm of one of the posts. A hand organ is playing. It is one with the ceaseless circling of the merry-go-round. For a moment, it seems that they will never get off the merry-go-round because it will never stop. I feel like one who looks down on the avenue from the 50th story of a building. But at length, they do get off. Even the music of the hand organ has ceased for a moment. My father has acquired ten rings, my mother only two, although it was my mother who really wanted them. They walk on along the boardwalk as the afternoon descends by imperceptible degrees into the incredible violet of dusk. Everything fades into a relaxed glow, even the ceaseless murmuring from the beach and the revolutions of the merry-go-round. They look for a place to have dinner. My father suggests the best one on the boardwalk, and my mother demurs, in accordance with her principles. However, they do go to the best place, asking for a table near the window so they can look out on the boardwalk in the mobile ocean. My father feels omnipotent as he places a quarter into the waiter's hand as he asks for a table. This place is crowded, and here too there is music, this time from a kind of string trio. My father orders dinner with a fine confidence. As dinner is eaten, my father tells of his plans for the future, and my mother shows the expressive face of how interested she is and how impressed. My father becomes exultant. He is lifted up by the waltz that is being played, and his own future begins to intoxicate him. 
My father tells my mother that he is going to expand his business, for there is a great deal of money to be made. He wants to settle down. After all, he is 29. He has lived by himself since he was 13. He is making more and more money. And he's envious of his married friends, since he visits them in the cozy security of their home, surrounded, it seems, by calm domestic pleasures and by delightful children. And then, as the waltz re reaches the moment when all the dancers swing madly, then, then, with awful daring, then he asks my mother to marry him. Although awkwardly enough and puzzled, even in his excitement and how he had arrived at the proposal, and she, to make the whole business worse, begins to cry. And my father looks nervously about, not knowing at all what to do now. My mother says, It's all I've wanted from the moment I saw you. Sobbing. And he finds all of this very difficult. Scarcely to his taste. Scarcely as he thought it would be. On his long walks over Brooklyn Bridge in the reverie of a fine cigar. And it was then that I stood up in the theater and shouted, Don't do it. It's not too late to change your minds, both of you. Nothing good will come of it. Only remorse, hatred, scandal, and two children whose characters are monstrous. The whole audience turned to look at me, annoyed. The usher came hurrying down the aisle, flashing his searchlight, and the old lady next to me tugged me down into my seat, saying, Be quiet. You'll be put out, and you'll be paid 35 cents not to come in. And so I shut my eyes, because I could not bear to see what is happening. I sat there quietly. Five. But after a while, I began to take brief glimpses, and at length I watched them again with thirsty interest, like a child who wants to maintain his sulk, although offered a bribe of candy. My parents are now having their picture taken in a photographer's booth along the boardwalk. The place is shadowed in the mauve light, which is apparently necessary. The camera is set to the side on its tripod, and it looks like a Martian man. The photographer is instructing my parents how to pose. My father has his arm over my mother's shoulder, and both of them smile emphatically. The photographer brings my mother a bouquet of flowers to hold in her hand, but she holds it at the wrong angle. Then the photographer covers himself with the black cloth which drapes the camera, and all the one sees of him is the one protruding arm in his hand which clutches the rubber ball, which he will squeeze when the picture is finally taken. But he is not satisfied with their appearance. He feels with certainty that somehow there is something wrong in the pose. Again and again, he issues from his hidden place with new directions. Each suggestion merely makes things worse. My father is becoming impatient. They try a seated pose. The photographer explains that he has pride. He is not interested in all this for the money. He wants to make beautiful pictures, my father says. Hurry up, will you? <laughs> we haven't got all night. But the photographer only scurries about apologetically and issues new directions. The photographer charms me. I approve of him with all my heart, for I know just how he feels. And as he criticizes each revised pose according to some unknown idea of rightness, I become quite hopeful. But then my father says angrily, Come on. You've had enough time. We're not going to wait any longer. And the photographer, sighing unhappily, goes back under his black covering, holds out his hand, and says, One, two, three, now. And the picture is taken, with my father's smile turned into a grimace and my mother's bright and false. It takes a few minutes for the picture to be developed, and as my parents sit in the curious light, they become quite depressed. Six. They have passed a fortune teller's booth, and my mother wishes to go in, but my father does not. They begin to argue about it. My mother becomes stubborn, my father once more impatient, and they begin to quarrel. For what my father would like to do is walk off and leave my mother there, but he knows that would never do. My mother refuses to budge. She is near to tears, but feels an uncontrollable desire to hear what the palm reader will say. My father consents angrily and they go, both go into a booth, which is, in a, in a way, like the photographer's, since it is draped in black cloth and its light is shadowed. The place is too warm, and my father keeps saying that all, this is all nonsense, pointing to the crystal ball on the table. The fortune teller, a fat, short woman, garbed in what is supposed to be oriental robes, comes into the room from the back and greets them, speaking with an accent. But my father feels that the whole thing is intolerable. 
He t- tugs my mother's arm, but my mother refuses to budge. And then, in terrible anger, my father lets go of my mother's arm and strides out, leaving my mother stunned. She moves to go after my father, but the fortune teller holds her arm tightly and begs her not to do so. And I, in my seat, am shocked more than it can ever be said, for I feel as if I were walking a tightrope a hundred feet over a circus audience, and suddenly the rope is showing signs of breaking, and I get up to my seat and begin, begin to shout once more the first words I can think of to communicate my terrible fear, and once more the usher comes hurrying down the aisle, flashing a searchlight, and the old lady pleads with me, and the shocked audience has turned to stare at me, and I keep shouting, what are they doing? Don't they know what they are doing? Why doesn't my mother go after my father? She does not do that. What's she going to do? Doesn't my father know what he is doing? But the usher has seized my arm and is dragging me away, and as he does so, he says, what are you doing? Don't you know that you can't do whatever you want to do? Why should a young man like you, with your whole life before you, get hysterical like this? Why don't you even think about what you're doing? You can't act like this, even if other people aren't around. You'll be sorry if you don't do what you should do. You can't carry on like this. It's not right. And you'll find out soon enough that everything you do matters too much. And he said that, dragging me through the lobby of the theater and into the cold light. And I woke up into the bleak winter morning of my 21st birthday, the window still shining with its lip of snow. The morning already begun. That was uh, Delmore Schwartz in Dreams Begin Responsibilities, uh, courtesy of the Iowa Review, who puts it online for us to read and share. Uh, I wish you well, and uh, of course, I am personally sorry for the many ways I have failed as an uncle. Uh, Hope you guys are well, and I'll talk or see to you soon.